through to all of you. Um, so let's start with Andy and Michael. Will you go ahead and do your music thing? Absolutely. Thank you, Jay, for inviting me. Um, this piece, first of all, let me just say, Jay, thank you for posting a link to the Help the Dene Elders uh, on the reservation, the Navajo Reservation at Four Corners, which is the size of West Virginia. There are 550 plus confirmed cases and 25 confirmed deaths, which leaves the mortality rate at about 4%. And I agreed with them um, very much. The song that uh, Michael has agreed to help me um, play is What Wondrous Love Is This? And it's a song that is sung, um, this was recorded about a year and a half ago. I traveled with several of my longtime musician friends and we arranged nine hymns. We traveled to Kirtland, Ohio, and we performed in the temple and the temple was gracious enough the next day to allow us to record some of these hymns. And uh, we arranged in three days, uh, hosted by the Community of Christ group, nine new hymns. I always thought we would get back into the studio. It may not happen. The vocalist is lovely. She's a, she's a neighbor of mine. Her name is Miriam Stay. The violinist is Kristen Beeson Juarez, and I play the dulcimer on this arrangement. Michael's going to post the lyrics. It's apropos for Good Friday. It talks about Christ. It talks about death, and what we gain is an eternity. I'll let the music speak for itself. Go ahead, Michael. Are you there, Michael? He's working on it. I'm here. Okay. We're almost there. Okay, I'll wait. It was a beautiful experience. There's, I've uploaded these to SoundCloud, so if others would like to hear more of these tunes, let me know, and I'll post a link. So Michael, you know the music stopped, right? <clears throat> we practiced this even earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Once we get this down, honestly, Faith again can go on the road everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Michael, I believe you're on mute. Okay, we're gonna keep trying this. If we need to do it without the words, we can do that. I can put the words on later. <clears throat> No, we should be able to do this. Uh, okay, I'm just going to do the music. That's fine. Mm.
That was beautiful. Thank you, Jay, for letting me share it. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, Michael, for your help with that. Appreciate it very much. Um, let's see. Jody, would you mind offering an opening prayer? Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> thank you. Too. Our dear God, on this day when we have so many thoughts of thee and of thy son, this day when he felt with us and became a part of us as a revelation as an, and as an ongoing experience each moment, we are grateful. We are grateful that we can have this call to mourn together, to feel together, and to renew into a new life together. We are grateful for all those who are here, who are participating tonight and, and offering this evening to us. We are grateful for the thoughts and the time and the research and the words that will be shared. We are grateful for Kate and Sam and their willingness to provide something on this extraordinary day for us. And we pray that we may have ears to hear, a willingness to learn, and a feeling of being a part of each other that we can carry into the future. Please help us to have thy guidance and comfort, thy peace and thy inspiration with us, and help us to listen for those things as we seek to see thee in each other. And these blessings we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, Sam and Kate. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't read their bios on the website, please do. They're worth reading. These are people that are quite remarkable. Um, but just to get to know them a little bit better, we're going to ask us a couple of questions that they had not had a chance to think about, like. What is one of your favorite books? Don't forget to unmute you two. <laughs> I have been saying for years that my favorite book is Middlemarch, but I've been saying it for 20 years. So I recently decided I should probably reread Middlemarch before I keep saying that. <laughs> it's true, we change. Yeah. Sam? Uh, I sort of vacillate between Nabokov's memoir, Speak Memory, and his uh, achingly beautiful meditation on mortality disguised as a postmodern puzzle called Pale Fire. And I think if I'm feeling uh, complicated, it's Pale Fire. And if I'm feeling straightforward, it's Speak Memory. And say his name again. Uh, sorry, I'm both pretentious and have spent time in Russia. So uh, I think people call him Nabokov, maybe. Nabokov. Nabokov, maybe. Nabokov is his Russian name. He's the guy that wrote uh, Lolita, which was oh. super famous, but I don't think uh, anywhere near his best book. Okay. Wow, interesting. Now, how about a favorite piece of music? You two? We might have the same one song by Patty Griffin called Mary about Mary the mother of God yeah. beautiful lyrics and a beautiful hymn to a woman who means different things to people all over the world nice nice Sam yeah I might just uh, I might just remind us that Patty Griffin has another gorgeous uh, hymn really but but folk song called mother of God that's another angle on to Mary. Okay. I, I have very strong, I'm, I'm quite, I was going to say straight lace, but I think Kate would laugh about that. But I'm very, uh, I'm a deeply believing Latter-day Saint. And I also have a great reverence, love, affection, and interest in uh, Mary, the mother of God. Nice, nice. And a favorite place you like to be? My great grandfather bought some land over a hundred years ago. 
up in the Uinta Mountains. And so I share a cabin there with my cousins. We get to spend a couple of weeks there every summer. And that, that sounds lovely. For me, that's it, yeah. I'll be a little sappy because I've been on exile in the basement to protect my family, but my favorite place is with Kate. Yeah, you've had a pretty, well, you both had it rough, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, that's sweet. Well, okay, let's go for it, you two. However you want to do it, whoever you want to go first. We're going to have Sam go first, because we manufactured some controversy to keep you all excited and interested. <laughs> Kate is definitely the optimist in the relationship. She's a <laughs> glass is full to brimming, and uh, I see the glasses shattered, and what little water was in it is now on the carpet on the floor. But. So you will see, uh, you will see our our personalities. But I think those complementary personalities, I think, are really brought to a fullness in Christ. This is an Easter sermon that I call "Easter is not the answer." I don't remember where I was when it came to me, like a puzzle finished by an unseen visitor after you've gone to bed for the night. What I do remember was that I was recurring through the cycles of winter and summer and the spaces in between, wading thigh deep through the world's sadness one archetypal spring. I wanted Easter to come. In retrospect, that season prefigured this terrible pandemic in its sadness and in its timing. I remember craving the glory of the empty tomb, the wet eyes eternally dried, the Jesus of Nazareth, now undeniably the Christ I needed Easter to be the answer to my woe. But Easter is not the answer. It's something else entirely. I don't want you to get too comfortable. I'm not going where I'm supposed to be. I won't stake a claim in these culture wars between people who need questions to feel alive and those who seek safe harbor and answers. Because questions and answers belong to each other. A hunger for truth and clarity, what we might call answers, motivates the good questions and finding answers opens up new vistas for questioning. It's generally not until we have real answers that we can even ask intelligent questions. That's all well and good, but my Easter revelation wasn't about controversies over questions and answers and the relative merits of those who favor one over the other. Easter doesn't care whether we identify with questions or answers, which battle trenches we inhabit in contemporary politics. Easter wants something else. Easter calls us and the world we love to a disorienting transformation. I'm aware that I'm not describing Easter as we normally talk about it, the direct solution to our worries and woes. To understand Easter as something other than the answer requires that we rewind past the Reformation, past even the Catholic Church that the Reformers wanted to fix. We need to forget how things end up. Time needs to flow from its undetermined present into an unknown future. We need to visit the present of the disciples whose life stories became the New Testament when they wove them with the story of Yahshua, the carpenter turned prophet from Nazareth. And I'll note that I find Tom Wright's accounts of these stories persuasive and illuminating and have found my views of Easter to be shaped by his. The account of Jesus's life as we find it in the New Testament is a story of a clear seeing poor man who defied common expectations about humans and holiness. It also speaks of the people with loyal hearts and dim wits who followed him, the person anointed by Israel's God. These disciples needed an anointed king of Israel. I don't, I don't the carpet I don't remember you doing it. They were hungry and often afraid, laboring constantly with uncertain prospects for success. These women and men felt abandoned by God. Their national pride was injured. They were angry. Jesus was the answer. If we read the Psalms, the songs of sorrow, fear, yearning, and praise that are the framework within which Jesus lived and preached, we see that the answer Israelites wanted most often was freedom from death, sorrow, and pain. They called for an external force to solve those problems. With the intensity of a hungry child, the singers of Psalms cry out that what matters most about us is that we will die and that we suffer in the meantime. 
God matters to the extent that God honors God's promise to liberate Israel from such suffering. The answer the Psalms appear to seek, in other words, is a simple cure for human dis-ease. Easter is not that cure. Jesus is not that man. What Jesus knew and when he knew it remains a mystery, to me at least. We suspect, based on the scriptures, that he learned the meaning of his life one passage at a time, one grace followed by another. I wonder whether, in the midst of his great pain, Jesus, Jesus moved from grace to grace in Gethsemane. Was that when he finally got it? When he finally brought all of us into himself in an act of free and complete identification? If so, then Jesus was learning about his mission until the day he died. Little wonder it took his followers even longer to gain an inkling of what Jesus meant. What's not a mystery is that the disciples were dullards. Time after time they looked on, unknowing, as he stirred up trouble and drew the world that they knew out of focus. Standing next to the mortal Jesus, they didn't know him, couldn't even recognize him. They had his future backwards and not even a blurry image of what that future would call them to. But they are our exemplars in their ignorance and in their ultimate knowledge. The story of Jesus' life and death and life again was that we've had it all wrong. Most days we still have it all wrong. Along with the disciples, we thought that power was powerful, that wealth and prosperity were good in the same way that creation is good. We thought the Messiah was the answer to the Psalms. We thought the Messiah was the mighty warrior sent to kill the Romans. We thought that religion was to make us feel happy or strong, to persuade us that we are the better sort of folk. We thought that tax, tax collecting, da, 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 sorry about that. Hard to talk about taxes right now, I guess. We thought that tax collecting traders and bedraggled prostitutes were the world's dross, the problem with the world. We also thought that death was the problem that had to be spelled with a capital P. We thought that we must always live in the shadow of that horrid stillness, and our task was to do war with it. We were forever stalked by the ugly quiet of a no longer breathing body and the suffering inherent in human life. Many disciples thought Jesus was a miracle worker and the activist preacher who had reformed Jerusalem society. They knew that he would not die before that mission was fulfilled. I don't mean to overstate their ignorance, although if I did so, I would fit safely within the New Testament. They did get some things right, like we all do, in the midst of their ignorance. They at least knew that they belonged to him, if nothing else. And yet consistently, Jesus told them that they did not know him. They never did. Not even the most famous and devoted of the disciples knew what Jesus was for or what he was saying. They hoped for a lot of things. They prayed with the Psalms that God would answer their questions, would solve their problems. And then their Messiah was dead, murdered casually and horribly by an indifferent state. His followers had gotten used to the notion that he would humor the outcasts, even love them. But they hadn't thought that he, at the end, was the worst of such outcasts. But there he was, and then there he wasn't. Just a body. Just that same accursed stillness of death. The same brutal indifference to the weak and forgotten that he thought, that they thought he would solve for them. Details are sparse in the New Testament, but it seems fair to guess that the disciples cried and stared and tried fruitlessly to sleep. They rehearsed his preaching in their minds and the miracles he worked and asked why everything had gone wrong. What had happened to the Psalmic hero who would rise to liberate Israel from its political and religious oppressors? And then Easter. A devout woman went to prepare Jesus' broken body for burial. Let the men stare uncomprehending, wallowing in their discomfiture. There was work that needed to be done. So she put her shoulder to the proverbial wheel. However much the disciples failed to understand about Jesus, she could see that she owed this respect to his broken body and their shattered dreams. She could hold his discarded body in her hands and say that it was still loved. It didn't matter to her that he had failed 
that he was not the Messiah they had dreamed of. It mattered that she loved him, and she sensed that he had loved her. What she discovered was that the world was forever turned upside down. The tomb was empty, and the divine gentleness of the once dead Jesus stood beside her. When he called to her, she too did not immediately recognize him. She thought he might be a gardener standing beside her in the empty tomb. Stunned by his return from death and whatever its state stands between death and new life, she returned as the first witness of Christ's resurrection. Tom Wright and others have called the authentic, have called out the authentic and world inverting ring of the fact that the witness to the great and founding miracle of Christianity was a woman, a person not even authorized by Jewish law to bear valid testimony. Jesus and his disciples shared a luminous few weeks where he began to explain to them just how wrong they had been throughout his ministry. He made clear to them the call that had been imposed upon them. He told them how miserable their lives would be. Death and suffering awaited them on the road to a remaking of heaven and earth. And then he left them, promising a spiritual presence that we know as the Holy Ghost to get about their painful business of loving the world into a new state of existence. And here we see the answer is that Easter isn't. It's not that Christ was safely in paradise with a thief who died beside him. It's not that death is not the end. It's not freedom from suffering and strife, but instead the possibility of a lot more of it. Easter is the fact that the psalmist's questions don't make sense. Those questions feel good, even necessary, and they are honest, but they are not what matters not on Easter. On Easter, we discover forever that we have been asking the wrong questions. We thought it mattered that Christ was dead. We thought it mattered whether the Romans defeated him. We thought it mattered that his disciples felt safe, but it doesn't, not really. Our mortal lives matter. By God, they matter. But the fact of our coming death is a distracting mirage I want to be as careful as I can be here. I am no Gnostic. We mortals are not illusions. Our bodies are not illusory. But whether we are dying or not, is not is, isn't the issue. We die, yes, the risen Christ seems to say. But that's not the point. The point is that the world is not as it seems, not even about the big things. And we are called to see, love, and transform that upside-down world. This is why the Easter gospel is so threatening in our modern age. Easter says that, the war, that we've read the world upside down and backwards, and we can't stop. It's as if we are addicted to a powerful drug. We want our merely human needs to be the most important story. We want to imagine that access to a surplus of consumer goods and comfortable beds and fine food is the answer to the questions the sometimes brutal world poses to us. Easter says that we can and must break that addiction. There is something much better. There is a world transforming love and our capacity to live within it. As always, the truth can be made to sound awful. I repeat, I am no Gnostic, and I don't mean any offense. I'm just wanting to be clear. The world is real and our bodies matter. Grief is no illusion. The pain we feel is actual. And God forbid that we ever trivialize the misery of the sufferer. In fact, our tender regard for those who suffer is indeed what matters more than the fact of our looming deaths. Our ability to sucker at the interface between time and eternity is the true mark of our incarnation. Note that our confusion goes deep. It goes all the way down. The question again is not whether we die, whether we will suffer, whether we will ache. In various proportions and at different times, we all will. The question is whether this sometimes agonized life is lived within the Christ who defies our expectation about how the world works and the Christ whose light and grace permeates the universe, lived there and then in the eternal realm suffusing our relentlessly mortal hours, we realize that we are free from the tedious and confused questions the disciples always asked. We will flicker between the human and divine realms in the company of the risen Christ. We will know that the lilies of the field don't worry about their meals or who is persecuting them 
or why they are unhappy or that they will one day die. They live in the full power and grace of God's animating love. We want the good to prosper and the evil to suffer. We want to know that if we sing the right psalms, our enemies will be vanquished. We want to hear that we will never die. Can we have those reasonable requests? Easter offered, in my view, no answer to those desires, to the psalms read in that urgently human way so familiar to our modern ears. Easter offered instead a world in the process of being remade and a call for us to put our shoulders, like the women at the tomb, to the wheel. In our earnest love of a broken world full of life and the promise of beauty, we are part of that rebirth. That is the story of Easter. Everything looks the same, but nothing can ever be again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's beautiful. Thank you, Susan. Hmm. You're... Thank you, Sam. It was lovely. Yeah, you still needed you. Why don't we take just just a moment um, to just sit with that for a sec before we go on to Kate. Jay, can you ask them to unmute their computer? Okay, I think I've survived. <laughs> okay. Or Sam was talking about how Easter is not the answer. My remarks all entitle How Easter is the Answer. When Sister Burton, Linda K. Burton, was a newly called Relief Society General President, uh, she gave her first talk at, in that role at General Conference. And in part of that talk, she said, quote, all that is unfair about life can be made right through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I think my experience of this quotation illustrates well the truth of it. I was excited when I heard her say these words, all that is unfair about life can be made right through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I heard, I was excited because the words were wise and because they were given by our new Relief Society general president. And then I was disappointed when I read the talk because she was actually quoting someone else, a curriculum writer. I wanted the wise words to be hers, not someone else's. But just because the conditions weren't the way I wanted them to be, doesn't mean there wasn't truth, beauty, and access to God in the quotation. I was interrupting the work of Jesus in my heart by wanting to impose Kate-approved conditions on the revelation of God's truths. Let's look a little more closely at the statement itself. I wonder what would grammar giant Strunk and White recommend here or Steven Pinker? The statement is a little convoluted and it's in the passive voice. A more active formulation would be, the atonement of Jesus Christ can make right all that is unfair about life. What does the passive construction accomplish? Why did it make it past the editors? Why is it worth being passive there? The construction helps us to feel the urgency behind the problem the statement solves. The problem that life is unfair, that it is an urgent problem because life really is unfair. My remarks tonight explore the miracle that the atonement can make right, 
all that is unfair and how we can get out of the way to let that happen. I am a person who likes to identify steps and a plan. There is another quotation that helped me to think more in terms of action to be able to take, to know I'd done my part in being worthy of the miracle that President Burton and the curriculum writer described. I know that statement will push buttons for some of you, but it's me saying the way I see the world. The quotation is from Leona Jacobs, a member of the Relief Society General Board just after World War II. My nephew Jonathan recently reminded me of the quotation, and I'll start by telling you about Jonathan, who is currently a missionary in California. He's a really good, kind kid. He's a good thinker. He's learning to cook, and he frequently quotes from my book at the pulpit in his weekly letters home. He chooses the less famous talks from women that church members today haven't heard of. So I really don't think you could ask for more in a person than you can get in Jonathan Brown. A few weeks ago in his letter, he quoted Leona Jacobs. She had been uh, with her husband. Her husband was called to be a mission president in Palestine just before World War II. And so she went there to be with him and her two grade school aged children. Then uh, World War II, when, when England declared war, the church brought them home from Palestine, decided it was no longer safe for them. And she wrote some articles for the Deseret News about what she'd seen. She tried to make sense of life in a place that was strange to her and to share with other people in her own country what she'd seen in a different country. That's also what she was doing after World War II in her Relief Society work when she was called to be on Bill Spafford's general board. She was trying to explain what she observed about God's world, a kind of foreign country, to members of the church. Now here's the quotation from her that I've meditated on this week that has really made a meaningful, a really personally meaningful Holy Week for me. She was asking her audience, how can we prepare our hearts to really be open to God, the atonement? Um, and this is what she said, preparing our hearts means humbling oneself before the Lord. It means ridding oneself of bitterness and selfishness. It means complete forgiveness of all wrongs inflicted upon us, real or imagined. And it means opening wide one's heart to righteousness, putting oneself in an attitude to receive good. Observing Holy Week in some way and fasting on Good Friday are ways we prepare our hearts for the miracles of Jesus and his atonement, two of many ways. Preparing these remarks this week has so structured my week that I'm using the quotation to structure the rest of the thoughts I hope to share with you. The first statement she makes, the first bit of advice towards preparing our hearts for the Lord is humbling ourselves before the Lord. I became aware of what a good person that nephew Jonathan was a couple of years ago when our families who live far apart were able to get together. Some of us performed baptisms for the dead together. And I remember that it was mostly a positive experience for me, but still a little mixed. You might remember that program, Pushing Daisies, that only had a season or two on television. But at the beginning, the main character would always say, this is what's going well, this is what's not going well. And I remember in one episode, he said, why does it always have to be a mix? Why can't it just be 100% good? Well, in these baptisms for the dead experience, the positive for me outweighed the negative. And the reason, there were two reasons the positive outweighed the negative. One was I made a choice to have the positive outweigh the negative. And the other was God's grace came pouring in to change my heart in ways that I myself could not have changed my heart. I hadn't been involved in baptisms for the dead since I was a teenager. So I really saw the experience with fresh eyes. And the thing that was a little bit negative for me was that Sam and his brother were witnesses they, to the baptisms. They sat in a special little box and nodded about whether things had been done properly. My job 
was to give towels to the people coming out of the font, the baptismal font. And I felt bothered about them sitting in their fancy box while I handed out towels. Why couldn't women sit in the fancy box, pay attention and nod their heads when something was done correctly? Now, at the same time that I was wrestling with that, I didn't want the wrestling to overwhelm the goodness of what was going on. Cousins together, doing service for the dead, participating in a ritual that was timeless and holy and invited the spirit of God. I prayed for help to be humble. I tried to see God in the handing out of the towels. I tried to make not just my daughters and my nieces, but also the few sister missionaries who happened to be there and were strangers. I tried to make them all feel the love of God as I handed them their towels. I felt the legacy of that temple baptism experience the next day when I had to do something that really scared me. And I felt extra spiritual support for it. I felt like God was saying that he saw my efforts to put myself and my family in holy places. And he would reward those efforts despite all the complicated things, my own shortcomings, and maybe those of our collective cultural imperfect understanding of what gender means. I felt he generously rewarded my imperfect attempt to be humble. Uh, now, the, the reason that's a happy example ultimately um, is because now I could sit in the fancy box and nod my head at the end of the baptisms while Sam took a turn, his brother took a turn handing out the towels. I, I just love that we can take turns instead of all having um, one role each time. The next line I wanted to focus on from Jacobs was this, ridding ourselves of bitterness and selfishness helps us to prepare our hearts. When we let go of bitterness and selfishness, and Jesus will help us if that's something we're trying to choose, I believe that, there are compensations for the roads not taken. I thought Jacobs was so smart to link bitterness and selfishness together. They seem to me to be closely related. I believe they often come from a place of fear. And fear leads us to prioritize our own desires and agendas over those of other people. Selfishness. My favorite representation of how Jesus can interrupt this destructive, selfish process is Isaac Denison's short story, Babette's Feast. Near the end of the story, a general who as a young man had been wounded by love, feels himself become the mouthpiece for a transcendent message. Quoting him, he said, we tremble before making our choice in life. And after having made it again, tremble in fear of having chosen wrong. But the moment comes when our eyes are opened and we see and realize that grace is infinite. That which we have chosen is given us. And that which we have refused is also and at the same time granted us. End quote. Bitterness and selfishness come from our worries about self-preservation. What the general's moment of enlightenment teaches us is that God will preserve us. He will take care of us. We can let go. And in letting go, we free ourselves from selfishness and bitterness because we don't have to look out for our own interests. What we choose is ours and what we did not choose, what we missed out on is also ours somehow. Next line from Jacobs, quote, complete forgiveness of all wrongs inflicted upon us, real or imagined. I reread this quotation earlier this week, the morning after a rough evening when I'd felt angry with someone. I don't like feeling angry. And when I prayed that night, I asked Heavenly Father to take it away. In recent years, I have learned some things about forgiveness that it has nothing to do with the, whether the other person has earned it, and that I usually can't achieve it on my own. I can express the desire to forgive in prayer, and God or Jesus, there's so much overlap there, makes it actually happen, makes the forgiveness happen. My experience of anger is that at the same time, it includes my grappling with injustice, it also invokes my self-doubts, and my fears about being misapprehended and misrepresented. 
Logically, I could make anger much less painful by acknowledging that because I am human, my shortcomings are inevitable. I will have flaws, do have flaws. Logically, I could also make anger less painful by admitting that I will be misapprehended and misrepresented, misunderstood and mischaracterized. That is what happens in this life. But logic only partially heals wounds and that is why I need grace. The next morning, after my plea for release from anger, I felt washed clean of the anger, and I was grateful. I counted a miracle to be released from feelings that make us suffer. Next line. It means opening wide one's heart to righteousness, putting oneself in an attitude to receive good. This time in the church is a healing one for me personally. I feel deeply grateful for changes in the forms of our sacred rituals and for other changes as well. As a historian, I know that the successes of some of these changes depends on our ability to communicate about them and also to find God in them. Uh, in the 1970s, the young women and young men organizations introduced shadow leadership. And what they meant by that was instead of doing everything on behalf of the youth, they wanted to mentor the youth so they could become leaders, so they could plan things and carry things out themselves and the leaders would be there to support them. But uh, all of the communication channels that people were accustomed to, this was right on the heels of correlation that really switched things up, turned the world outside, upside down in a different way than Jesus did. Uh, those, those were all confused and there weren't good ways to train people. And because of that, nobody understood shadow leadership. The few people who tried it, they felt like it didn't really work and shadow leadership was marked as a big failure. Well, for the past several decades, and again, right now, we're emphasizing that same thing. We don't call it shadow leadership, but we're emphasizing leaders should work with youth in a way that mentors them and helps them to plan and carry things out and fulfill and pray about the people the, the young women that are under them, um, we're, trying it, we're trying it again. And there are a couple of reasons why I think these things we've tried in the past that we're now trying again have a better chance at success. One is that the communication channels is much better. The other is that today's emphasis on personal revelation can help us to find God in policies and procedures. Not that they didn't talk about personal revelation 40 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, but, but we really emphasize it now. The other difference is the emphasis on our identity as disciples of Christ. As positive as I understand many of them to be, these changes we have today still have flaws. We live in a fallen world. And in light of that, the church's increasing emphasis on Jesus is richly appropriate. So in the spirit of following Jacobs and opening wide my heart to receive righteousness, one way I have tried to put myself in an attitude to receive good is in honoring President Nelson's admonition to refer to the church by its proper name. In opening my heart to that, I have found that his emphasis on the name of the church has helped me to take my own discipleship more seriously. And I'm grateful for anything that does that for me. I like that my new work email address, I work for the church, has Church of Jesus Christ in it instead of LDS Church. I like the challenge of not putting Mormon in my writing of church history. I like it because I'm a writer and it's a good intellectual challenge. And I like it because it opens my heart to seeing people in a slightly different way. I also like the new logo. It's hard to find a satisfying representation of Jesus or God. Maybe that's why Muslims wisely reject attempts to do so altogether. When I, oh, my daughter was young, it was maybe 18, 17 years ago, my friends didn't like the picture of Jesus that hung in our church. They didn't want their son associating that picture with Jesus. So they taught him, he was a toddler, that the man in the picture wasn't Jesus, that man was named Jim, and Jesus was someone else. What I like about the logo now so it's fallen world, not perfect. The sculpture is made by someone who was not a member 
of our church. So it represents us as an institution embracing the good outside of our own community. I like that the sculpture doesn't have contrasting colors. No beautiful patterns that I know would distract me into thinking about representation more than thinking about God. I like that the resurrected Jesus in the sculpture issues a loving invitation. It's not a depiction of an episode from his life at which we are observers, but instead interaction with that sculpture puts us in the present and asks us right now to reflect on our relationship with the resurrected Christ. Sam is right. The atonement is not a magic happiness pill to take away our problems. It is an invitation to do God's work and God's work is hard work and painful work. At the same time, doing that hard work and painful work is what makes us see and feel beyond what is unfair in our own small lives. When I look at that sculpture, I feel my savior knocking at my door. Today, Good Friday, is the day he suffered to make healing and collaboration with him possible. And Easter, this Sunday, is the day we celebrate his victory. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, thank you. Thanks so much, Sam and Kate, for your thoughts. I appreciate it very much. So now we're gonna try experiment. Normally in a physical faith again, we would break into small groups and you would explore, you know, a question or topic. So again, this topic is, at this time in your life, with what's going on in the world, in your life personally, whatever that might be, how you hear Jesus Christ or God, um, and how you feel maybe God is hearing you. So um, we're going to ask Jana to uh, break us up into groups. This will be random. I don't know who's going to go where. And then you'll have about 15, 20 minutes to um, talk to each other about what you're going through and how you're feeling about this time of, of uh, life. So when you do that, make sure when you get in your groups, you unmute yourself so that you can hear each other. There'll be a timer towards the end that'll let you know how much time you have left. I think we're giving you about a minute to wind down, a minute or two, so that you can wrap up. Um, so... Here we go. You ready? Yes. Now, Jay, tell me again the time, because I'm going to be timekeeper. And I was focusing on breaking into rooms. How, how much long do you want to, how much time do you want? About 20 minutes. 20. Okay. You have to accept uh, moving to another room, right? Don't you have yes, to so you'll get that okay. in just a second. You have no choice, Tom. <laughs> um, Jay, would you rather have three to four participants or four to five in each? Let's do four to five. Okay. There you go.
Thanks for having us back. Oh, I didn't know that we're rotating here. No. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Jay, you are muted. Yeah, it looks like Jay was trying to talk, but I was going to say the same. I, I can hear you in my own house, but not in my computer. Do you mind if quickly I report on our group for a quick second? Um, oh, yeah. A little bit what we what we talked about. What What was interesting to me was very much what Sam had said that Easter is a time to remake ourselves, a time of rebirth. And I think uh, what we discussed was in this pandemic, we are in the cave, much more than three days even. And how will we reemerge? Will we be reemerge completely tra traumatized by this or reborn? And what will we do with this time? That was something that I took away from our group. Nice, thank you. Who else would like to share something that came out of your group? Anybody else? It's interesting that our group also, at by the end of the group, that's where our discussion had trans transitioned. It wasn't exactly answering the questions that we were given, but we were talking about how this disruption in our lives might lead to change and what those changes might be it was an interesting discussion. And what, Mary Kay, were some of the changes that were explored that might happen? Well, no big surprise to you. I expressed that my great hope was having had a period where we were consuming less and seeing another way to live that we might realize we don't have to go back to the way it was before that we can have, for example, in the Salt Lake Valley, you're experiencing clean air mm. and oh. how, what a gift that is. And maybe that's a gift worth working to keep and making choices that um, you don't go back fully to how things were before um, and in many other ways. And then um, uh, one of the couples, the Christiansons talked about uh, recognizing the need for better health care for everyone. You know, maybe that's something that we can, having been through this disruption, have more empathy, those who, who do have access to good health care, empathy for those who don't, and work towards having um, a community where people have more equal access to the things that allow us to be healthy. Thank you, Mary Kay. Other thoughts? Love to hear what you what you uh, came up with. I'm going to quickly jump back in again. And that was brought up by uh, someone in our group. Our family is watching us. And, my, and I have children at home. Some of us still do have children at home. Usually my children are at school from early to late in the afternoon. But I'm noticing more and more that they do parallel my own activity, my own behavior, my own response to things. And I think we have to acknowledge this really, uh, the sinew between kin, that, that, that we are connected, not just as a people and a culture, but, but that our children are watching how we cope with this. And it's important for us to step up. That's a very good point. So I didn't um, bring this up in our group, but one really great thing that happened today, um, Tina's oldest daughter, who lives in Oslo, Norway, um, arranged an Easter meal um, for all of the family to participate in today. And so through Google Hangouts, a forum similar to this, um, each of us uh, shared our, our meal with each other, you know, in the sense of pictures and conversation and talking. So we had three in Stockholm, one in Oslo, and then us here in Utah. And it was just a delightful experience to have this virtual family gathering. Uh, this was how Tina and I kicked off our fast today. Um, you know, we we ate breakfast, we had a, a late brunch this morning, um, and then we're planning to fast until that time tomorrow. But um, it was just, you know, this this idea of, remote working and team virtual 
assemblies, um, it, you can turn it into something really positive like that. This is the first time we've done this, and it's been it was just a kind of a delightful experience. I love that idea. It's nice. Thank you. In our group, um, a couple of the ideas came forth of how um, we are realizing how many people live in the third world all the time, worried about food, worried about their basic um, livelihoods, and a certain a matter of reality hit us all that we are all in very um, tenuous situations, even though we feel most of the time we've got a great economy and things are going very well. We're very close to being third world in certain situations. So I was, I was, I was taken with that concept. There was also another thought that um, Kate and Sam seemed to bring out a tension, uh, and I'll try to be brief on this one. Oh, death, where is thy sting? And wow, death does sting. Both of those were really powerfully put forth in their talks. And I think that's especially a Latter-day Saint understanding that we are all eternal beings. And whatever that seems to mean, it means we don't die. And so we're in this couple of hours of eternity in which death really bothers us. Pain really bothers us. You know, it, we're, we, we're scared of it. We, we come from no one, nowhere. We're agnostics and, and we are heading nowhere, you know, food for worms. But at the same time, we're told that this is not the real story. And so I think uh, the Latter-day Saints have both of these things in their hands all the time. You know, Harold Bloom um, <clears throat> says that we, we just don't take death seriously. On one level, he's completely right. But on another level, we take it most seriously because we were part of the design in the Council on Heaven that says, let's do death. That'll, that, that's, that'll be powerful stuff. We'll all learn from that, how to be Christ's ourselves. We take ourselves, the name of Christ on ourselves to to learn what it's like to to lay down our lives for our friends ideally that's what it's all about anyhow i, I just wanted to lay that out there i appreciate that randy thank you you know I, go ahead. I wonder how much along that same line and and a lot of what's happened uh in the discussion today um this this uh unwillingness to be vulnerable uh as part of the human condition, we really avoid um, any any risk in, um, and we talk about this fear of, of being hurt, and and as uh, Randall, you just pointed out, this fear of dying, and um, along the lines of thinking of, you know, how can we kind of recreate the world through this? This is a time of total deconstruction. We are we are completely deconstructing everything that we do and how we interact and how we do church and work and and family and and everything in the world because we we have to it's it's almost like we have to well it's like we're clearing away the old temple we can't build a new one until we totally clear the old away and and all these references where Christ talks about getting rid of the old way and, and building this new life. Well, what is it that we're going to create, create, create out of this? Are we learning how to see the, the, the grace of vulnerability when we, when we can once again be in each other's presence? Are we going to be willing to let down the walls and the barriers. Are we going to be willing to risk that vulnerability, even if it means pain or even if it means death? Because that's what we're dealing with. Every day, death could come to any of us or any of us that we love. And at this time of Easter, when we are literally embracing what death brought to us, what death of God brought to us was a new God and a new life for all of us if we allow ourselves 
to step into that and be a part of it. Well, when, when those of us who return to church, are we going to return being willing to be vulnerable? Are we going to return creating a, a community rather than feeling like we have to behave a certain way? Are, are, we, are we returning to our, our um, families uh, more vulnerable? Or are we going to feel this pressure to do things the way they've always been done? Can we embrace the family members who are not who we expected them to be? And, and can we return to our civilizations, our, our communities, willing to step forward and go, this might hurt if I, if I share this with you, but let's see what happens because this is what can lead us towards a new life and a new world. And, and I think Christ is the example of complete vulnerability. I, I just don't see how he could have felt us and, and been one with us unless he let everything down, unless he, he let go of every barrier, expectation, condition. And, and I think that's the ultimate example that we can deal with right now, this, this entire process of the opportunity of seeing what new life emerges by letting every single barrier down even while we're completely sequestered. It's the beginning there's, of something that can happen. Thank you. There's a, it seemed to me going back to both Sam and Kate that uh, in some ways Easter is a Rorschach. Uh, and uh, uh, Rumi has this wonderful thing where someone comes and says, wake up, wake up, Jesus is here. And the person says, I don't, I don't care. I, wanna go, I, I need to go back to sleep. And, room, and, G, and the, the man says, I don't care if you're dead. Jesus is here and he wants to resurrect somebody. <laughs> well, in, in a way, it seems to me that going back to what uh, uh, dear, uh, Jody said, that all things can be made new and that in a way, the way people look at Easter, uh, either as a great opportunity to restart the economy and crowd all together in churches, or as a way in which we can all be made new. Everything is going to be made new anyway, and we can start making it new by resurrecting the best things that we have both in our tradition, in our culture, in our lives, in our history, in our families. All of our families, all of our personal lives have great experiences that we can resurrect, we can bring back to life and create new life and so the that that unbelievable news of the empty tomb uh can also be true in a metaphorical way for all of us those things that uh, we can bring anew into us to remake this world because the world is remaking us through uh things we didn't choose but we can choose to let it be a resurrection beautiful I could add in, in our um, in the group that we had after after spending a little time being uh, reacquainting myself with Phil Barlow after nearly forty years of uh, not having seen him, um, we talked about uh, generosity and and forgiveness and it, it strikes me that that uh, the generosity and forgiveness really uh, tie into what Jody's saying about vulnerability um, that I think that a lot of us will think about vulnerability in terms of um, you know, allowing ourselves uh, to be hurt. Um, and <clears throat> forgiveness in some respects is um, not holding it against uh, those who would hurt us um, and not having it bother us so much. Um, and that there's, a, that there's, and you know, of course, the, the discussion of forgiveness came out of what, uh, what Kate was uh, saying. And we all thought that, that, um, that Kate's discussion of uh, the experience of a woman in the church uh, is one that was extraordinarily generous and forgiving um, and allowed her or allows her um, to, to draw close to the church despite some things that might uh, be um, objectionable. Um, that, and so, you know, in some respects, you know, being able to, um, uh, to draw close to things that are good uh, because we're not repelled by our own judgments, our own lack of forgiveness or generosity, 
um, has the appearance of vulnerability um, in some respects. Um, but I think it's, that, it's, uh, that it's, it's a different side of vulnerability. Um, it's not as vulnerable as, as we feel uh, when we're taking offense. Um, if we're not taking offense, feeling vulnerable doesn't have the same sting and pain. Thank you. I wanted to report back briefly on our group. Um, we didn't discuss um, different Easter traditions as much or the, uh, the concerns with the coronavirus and, and how it's altered our lives. Um, we talked about where we're finding God today. And uh, we're finding God in some other faith traditions, in um, being able to be quiet and reflect, to respect others and uh, hear other voices. We find it in gardening. We find it in nature. Um, but we also find it in some of the opportunities that we have as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, an opportunity to fast and to pray um, and gain revelation in that manner, um, scripture study, and particularly to find ways of service um, have been really important um, as we get direction and impressions of how to go about helping others. Um, we've found God in our lives. And I think nature was also a big um, contributor to that, um, how much we love to be outside and uh, and feel closed off sometimes during this period. Thank you. That's lovely. Where did Phil Barlow and his cute wife go? I saw him briefly. There you are. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts? Did you just call my bride a, my cute wife, Jay? Yeah, she's not my cute wife. She's your cute wife, but yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> keep them straight. No, I don't think I have anything uh, fresh to give. I was um, just meditating on how much I was enjoying all of your insights and good spirits, and uh, especially Kate and Sam's um, fresh complimentary authenticity and reflections was delicious to us out here but i was um i just was particularly reflecting on jody's comments about um experiencing this pandemic as it intersects with easter as um like uh, through the lens of paul in the new testament talking about the crucifixion of the old person before you get to the new birth and um, the strand in some of our comments about this destruction and perilous vulnerability, perilous moment that we're in for so many of our populace. Um, also, also being the opportunity to allow our vulnerability to good death um, as Randy and others have said, um, Sam, who lives in the ICU, knows death and has death in his mind, um, in his writings, in his thoughts, in a very revealing, helpful way. But um, I also liked Randy's comment about death. Um, how did you say that, Randy? Let's do death, we said in the pre-existence. Let's go do death. Um, I, that's interesting thing. Anyway, I think through Paul and Jesus and that strand of our comments, we could reflect, at least I'm reflecting right now, um, about maybe the welcome, not comfortable, but welcome death of... Um, some of us, our old selves, that uh, before we jump too readily on the new birth. Latter-day Saints are rather too eager to get to the resurrection before experiencing the trauma and death part and, and fully absorbing the deathfulness of death before we dare hope for resurrection. So 
Um, so that was a scattered gunshot of a response that I, um, I love humanity by hearing the goodness and in thoughtfulness of you all. Thank you. Debbie, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, I think as Phil was talking, I um, have often said I need to lean into everything. And I, I think we, um, that has been powerful for me to say I need to lean into my sorrows as well as my joys. And, and that just makes, I think, our lives richer. We need to lean into our, the process of living and the process of dying. And just, um, I don't know, the leaning into sometimes I want to back away from things and that is not mostly not very helpful for me. I run from it instead of lean into it and know it better. So I was thinking of leaning in. I like that. <laughs> yes, Mark. So, you know, I, I love the themes, kind of the thread. One of the threads that I hear is the, the death of self. And my, my background before I came into the church 40 years ago was studying uh, Buddhism and Zen uh, practices and transcendental meditation. And they talk about, you know, die every moment to a Buddhist is a death. Or it, it, at least that's the aspired practice. And so, you know, we talk about vulnerability. And I liked um, Sister Barlow's comment of leaning into and, and uh, Randy's talk about the death, you know, the fullness of death, I guess we're learning, I think, in the church that we don't need to control everything in order to grow in the gospel. We don't need to overcome or resist because those are both uh, egocentric and, and we get into problems when we do, when, when that's our, our only two gospel buttons, you know, to overcome or to resist. And I hear in some of our comments tonight, like Sister Barlow said, to embrace or to lean into, we're, allow, we're allowing, in fact, I've, I've, I've noticed and done some kind of notation in my scriptures where all the passive verbs in the Book of Mormon uh, occur. And it, it often occurs, may, uh, may you be blessed after you live your covenants and, and uh, pray unto the Father and humble yourself, then it switches to a passive, passive verbs. May you be blessed. May, your, uh, may you be brought into God's presence. May, you be, uh, may your garments be made clean. And it's that passive things where um, I know Jana and I have talked about this uh, a couple years ago on a podcast where the gospel, um, where I, I don't I don't use the term passive in terms of being acted upon, but rather passive in terms of allowing God to work his work in us. And there's that wonderful scripture in Philippians where it talks about working out our salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. The next verse, it says, and allow God to work in within us, you know, it's, that's where, that's where God's work as we allow him, as we lean into, as we become vulnerable, like, like Sister England says, or we die to our own, you know, control, control, uh, efforts to control, that's where God can, can work his work within us. And I just love, I feel like we're learning that in our faith to not be so um, in charge of everything. And uh, that's, that's just my comments. I don't know if it means anything to anybody, but it, it does to me kind of the threads Thank of you. what Thank we've you. talked about. Thank you. You know, we have just, oh, maybe a little less than 15 minutes left. Um, and we have actually Mark and Lorena are gonna give a closing um, hymn. 
But Sam and Kate, did you have any other thoughts before we start to wind down? Make sure you unmute yourselves. Unmute, unmute. I think Sam should go first this time. He oh, and here I was waiting. Last time. <laughs> here I was waiting for you to talk. <laughs> oh, were you serious, Kate? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, it's been a strange, rough time. I've, you know, a lot of people are sort of wondering what to do with themselves and with their home lives as they've got layoffs and anxiety and concerns and political and cultural animosities as we struggle to figure out who caused this to be so bad. And I, I've been sort of stuck working these 18 hour days trying to build and then run clinical trials to find treatments for COVID and then trying to figure out which of us in the IC doctor group is taking care of which patients and who's got to field which phone calls. And it's been sort of dizzy and exhausting in its intensity. And there's a, I'm sure that the English romantics would have something to say about me wasting my life. But what's been striking to me more than anything is the importance of the body of Christ uh, I was in one of our virtual church meetings recently admitting that I feel bad that I don't, I'm not currently uh, out with a six feet apart with masks on visit to the widow across the street or looking out for the home teaching families that are on my list or taking the extra time and, and one of the stalwarts in our ward said, Sam, you take care of the damn virus. We'll take care of the home teaching. <laughs> and, and it was reassuring to me that in fact, in the body of Christ, we really can have different roles to play and none of them is worthier than the other and none of them is cause for our elevation over each other. They're just hard facts about the universe and in, in, in God and in Christ and in love, those hard facts are able to be brought into a kind of sense and our disparate needs and talents and anxieties and strengths are also brought into a harmony in the body of Christ. Thank you. Okay. I was particularly thinking about Debbie Barlow's comment about leaning in. And I realized the last couple of days I've been feeling some, not guilt, but a, a sense of failure, I guess, because I, I feel like the what Corona, what COVID-19 is offering those of us who aren't desperate for food to eat right now is, is quiet, is extra time in our lives. And, and I've been working longer hours than I normally do and, and feel like the leaning in and the reflection and some of those things that I would hope to accomplish during this time are not happening for me. And then I, as I was traveling the, those thoughts, I ended up at grace again, thinking this is the way my life looks. I do not, I never have, and I do not, and I probably will not have a, a quiet life. But what I did have this week was an opportunity to prepare some remor remarks that forced me to have a deadline and specific questions to bring to God in prayer that then did create some beauty and peace in my life, despite the, the busyness. That's where my thoughts were. Love them. Thank you. Did everybody feel like they had an opportunity to s express themselves? If not, we've got a couple minutes. Michael, Austin, do you have any thoughts? You expect um, lots of thoughts on by common consent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think 
this is just uh, it's been fascinating and it's been really very spiritually nourishing and i want to thank sam and kate so much for taking the time to do that um you know i've um andy and i have been talking because she's into bread really into bread you know she's like the bread lady uh about how the um most important ingredient in bread really is time um that you you um you know you mix together flour water salt and then you put in a leavening agent and then if you put that in the oven it turns into something really sucky but if you give it you know 24 hours of time something really miraculous happens uh, mm -hmm. living things uh, expand and uh, and create something wonderful and that's kind of how I'm looking at this virus right now, is it's, it's putting time into my spirituality. Um, and it's allowing me, it's forcing me to slow down, to consider, to think. And, uh, and this has actually been a remarkable Holy Week, I think, for that reason, because uh, I've had time like I've never had before and, and I'm very appreciative that, uh, that y'all invited me to to be part of this tonight because uh, it's been a major part of my Holy Week experience. So thank you. Thank you Michael. Thank you. Austin, I know Sam and Kate are foodies but the time we spend being apart from our loved ones is the time that allows life to thrive. That's the secret of the bread in sourdough it's the culture that is allowed to grow that gives it the flavor and the time that we are sacrificing from being being where we usually would be is the sacrifice that allows others to live and that's important for me to point out thank you thank you so much to all of you you, you just have enriched my day my week my holy week too and and I'm so grateful that you've been willing to come together on this evening and share your thoughts and feelings. It means a lot to me. Thank you again to Sam and Kate and Michael and Andy and, and Jody for that lovely prayer. Um, and Mark and Lorene, who will close us out with a beautiful hymn. Mark and Lorene, do you want to explain, explain where that hymn came from? And, Yes, um, this was written by a friend of ours, Fred Voros, who runs a um, hymn writing group that we like to attend because amazing things happen there. It's called Flesh and Blood and Bone. You might also, you might also want to make sure you mute everyone so that we can, uh, so that everyone can hear. Our God prepared for us a place of earth and sky of sea and stone. With sun and moon and stars above, with thorns and blossoms overgrown. And sent us here our spirits clad in flesh and blood and bone. And we are marvelously made in every hair and sinew so. For every part of us is and every one of us is known by God who loves us as we are in flesh and blood and bone. And even he as one of us Descended from a lofty throne 
to bear the burden of our race, to prove that we are not alone, to give himself our ransom here in flesh and blood and bone. He is greater everything as even death he made his own. And lay upon a cross of wood, and slept upon a slab of stone, and so we come to love a God in flesh and blood and bone. Okay, you need to unmute. Thank you, Mark and Lorraine. That was just gorgeous. Appreciate it so much. Gloria Reese, would you mind giving us um, a benediction for tonight? And then when she's done, you're welcome to unmute everybody and we can all say goodbye to each other. <laughs> Eternal parents, we are stunned with the messages of this evening and how it relates to this Holy Week and the sacrifice and the willing gifts that are in our behalf and that we have agreed to for our own salvation, that we die, that we follow that path all the way through. We're grateful for Kate and Sam and what they've put into this and for Mark and Lorraine and for uh, Andy's opening music and for Jay and for Jana and for the many who have put effort to this. We're grateful for a sense of community and a realization that we are all of the same fiber in this earth and that we, we feel one another in ways that are profound, even apart, that the spirit has and will manifest to us as we continue on in our lives. We're grateful for this gospel, for one another again, and for Christ. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gloria. And thank you, Janice Spangler, again for hosting. Yay. Yes, good to yeah. do it with you. Thank you. So you're welcome to unmute and say goodbye. If you want, or can you do that, Jenna? Unmute everybody. All right, goodbye. It was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Goodbye, Jane. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thanks, Jane. everybody. Bye, Jody. Richard. Bye. Good night. I don't know oh. you. Goodbye. Good night, <laughs> Andy. I don't know what you were doing over there, Randy, but good night. <laughs> Hello, Maxine. It's good to Checking see you. Checking the there. blood or what? Checking the blood pressure? Anyway, good night. Good night. It feels like we're the Brady Bunch. Good night. Good night, Grandpa. Good night, John Boyd. Here's a story the of a lovely lady. Maxine, sing it, Maxine. Sing it. Maxine. Keep going. Maxine, go for we're it. Going we're going down. I'm we're going down. I'm we're Maxine. losing numbers. I'm Maxine Brady. Who are you? <laughs> I'm Marsha. I'm Marsha. Marsha, Marsha. Thank you, Andy. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Good night, Maxine. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good to see you. Bye. Let's see who can be last. Bye. Okay. I love, Come on. Stay safe. Stay I love safe you guys. And well. Like Survivor. Take Come care. on. Stay safe and well. We're voting them off. <laughs>
<laughs> Everyone stay safe and well and healthy. Yeah. Uh, and we so lost another one. <laughs> <laughs> Going down. Good job, Jay. Oh, thank you. This is good. Thanks, we should Tom. do this more often. Thank you, Tom, for encouraging me to do it. <laughs> yeah, I did <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you. Maxine, I sorry. didn't know you were with us. I'm so glad you joined us. Yeah, I was here. I just got here late. I'm sorry. Okay. As usual, I got you. Yeah, I was going to say as usual. <laughs> well, how was life, Good Maxine? to have you, Maxine. Yeah, it was nice to be here. It was beautiful, Jay. Thank you. And you know what? It really, I live alone, and it really gives me a sense of community. I love Zoom meetings. Let's have more. Let's, okay. do, let's do faith again, like, once a week. <laughs> You know, Call me, Maxine. Call me anytime. Come on, Janet. You can do it. I will, Andy. But honestly, we have so many brilliant people. Every everybody who attended tonight, tonight could do a presentation. I, we we need this. I need this. Maybe everybody else doesn't, but I need it. Yeah, so I'll think about yeah. trying to do it more often. Yeah, it's a nice thought. Hey, Andy. There's a power in doing this Zoom thing. Yeah. I, every every call I've been on like this, either with our choir or other. Uh, going to COC meetings or other stuff. It, it's been very, very uh, uh, helpful Good. during this, this, this bizarro period in time yeah. of rebirth, I think, you know. I just want to say something to Andy. Thank you for sharing the, the metaphor of the bread and how, and not the metaphor, actually, the reality of time and being such an important thing. It's very salient for me right now in a relationship I'm in. So thank you. Thank you. That's going to inspire me to actually write the talk that my bishop assigned me to give. <laughs> really yeah. I, I touched us. I touched it, us too. We've been experimenting. Well, I, I've had the honor of making bread in your home. And honestly, you right. touched me That's... deeply. And Charity was with us. Charity was yeah, with us. She was. Hey, Barclay, you wanted to say, finish something? What were you saying? You no, know, I, I, it's just so salient for me. I, I couldn't have heard a more important message mm -hmm. tonight uh, uh, to help me understand a, someone. Good. And uh, I'm really grateful for it. Good. Well, I'm so glad. Yeah. I hadn't seen you in a while, so I'm so glad you showed up. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm glad you did this. Keep me in the loop. I hope we do this again. Yeah. We will. Right. Yeah, every week. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, Mark and Lorene, it's so nice to see you. My gosh, I want to come up. I want to come up for breakfast and just sit. <laughs> just I, I want to come up for breakfast and just sit with Jay and Jane and just sit like each of us like six feet apart. Can we do that? Can I? Can we come to your garden and sit six feet oh, apart? We, Mark, probably, I mean, we could do that in our backyard, which is full exactly. of wildflowers. You know, the backyard uh, is wonderful, Maxine. I know. I, I I love it. I've been up there. I want to come again. Like, I don't know. We have to be so careful. I just, I was reading the statistics today and realized that I live in the second highest concentration of COVID cases because I live over in Glendale. So oh. downtown is number one and Glendale is, <laughs> Glendale is number two. So it's like, I want to wow. go to the, I want to go to the bench, man. <laughs> wow. Mom, well, it's a good thing you left town when you did. <laughs> well, you know, Maxine, you put that out there, and I think we would love to do that. We'll have to talk about it and see if it's if there's a safe way to do it. it probably Feasible. is yeah. feasible. That's good. Our heart, your heart, your heart, heart is, stopped. feels good. <laughs> this, yeah, it's heart stopped. <laughs> this is kind of a the the. Um, what happens after, you know, a good sacrament meeting where people just kind of linger, linger. Yeah, oh, just, when we used to. When Wait, we used we ever? to. Remember, remember those days? Remember those days. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that this, was the evangelicals. This, yeah, this is, this, is the, this is the cultural hall right now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I like that. I love you all so much. I can't even stand it right now. Andy, speaking <laughs> of, <laughs> you. Speaking of culture. We're going to bring together again one day. Yeah. So Speaking Andy, Andy, how come you won't let us see you? I just want to know. Oh, oh, pandemic hair, Maxine, pandemic hair. <laughs> oh, I we all get that from time to time. I have totally I had low flow hair today. I had no shower head. It broke, so I had low flow hair. I do not want to admit how long it took me to choose the choose the photo today for my <laughs> Zoom profile. 
<laughs> all is vanity. Is, <laughs> is, uh, is I, bad hair contagious? No. <laughs> My gray, roots are, my gray roots are highly contagious, Mark. <laughs> we need to be vulnerable and authentic. Yeah, yeah, I have <laughs> I have pandemic hair. I am dying for a haircut. My hair is so, and I don't know where to go to get a haircut, and you I'm know, desperate for one. You know, okay. you know, Maxine, I just spoke to Molly Benyon, and she said those exact same words. <laughs> so they are not superficial. <laughs> like, where are we going to get a haircut, you know? I just, I'm, I'm going to cut it myself. I'm going to just chop it off, and then I'll really have pandemic just hair. Just remember the three Gs of haircuts. Don't, don't, and don't. <laughs> We need an online how to cut your own hair during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I'm, on it. I'm on it. it it's like we should just bu buzz it all off. I have it. thought about that. Lean into it. <laughs> Lean into the hair. Lean into the buzz off. I, ha I have yet to do my makeup during the pandemic. I just, I've Me given either. Up. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not going good, to. Good to hear you, Jan. I was just thinking we didn't get to hear any of your wisdom, darn it. Ah, I'm, 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 I'm a bit disconnected at the moment. <laughs> okay, there's that. <laughs> yeah. Allowed, but we are going we're, to move back because I want right. to hear more from you. We're going to go to bed and Bye sign back. off. Actually, okay. I, actually, Lorena's going to give me a haircut and I'm going <laughs> to give her a haircut. Could I, could I come up for breakfast and a haircut, maybe? <laughs> you know, I'm... No. I'm a, <laughs> no. I gotta say no, but somehow let's keep the conversation. Yeah. Keep it in in in, yeah. in conversation. I'm so I'm so tired of my food storage. I'm so tired of eating bread and hummus and beans and rice, and I'm dying to go get real food, and I'm just afraid to. So there should be drive-through COVID tests and haircuts. Oh my gosh. Well, if, if all the food preparers and makers would wear masks, I would feel a little more. I mean, I was peeling potatoes tonight and I thought, I'm breathing and sneezing and drooling all over my potatoes, you know? Right. I want whoever's making food, I want them to wear a mask, you know? Right. Yeah, I think they are. I'm hungry right. now. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Thank you all of you. Thanks, Jay. Jay. Thank you. God bless everybody. Thank right. you so much. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Tom, you're going to be the last man. <laughs> Wait for it! Wait for it! <laughs>